my name is Jessica Gordon. I'm a rheumatologist. I work at a Hospital for Special Surgery, which is in New York City. The title of this talk is Mini Medical School, A User's Guide to Medical Jargon. I'm structuring this talk uh, very much in the same way as I would teach case-based medicine to medical students. So I'm going to go through anatomy and physiology, and when we teach medical students, we find that they learn more when we use a case-based approach because it makes the facts that they're learning a little bit more interesting to them. So I'm going to use the same kind of approach to teach, but my goal is really to have you learn all of the different terms that the doctors use to see kind of the approach that they have when they are struggling with clinical questions or diagnoses and evaluation. And I want to bring that to you in that way. But my goal is for you not to become your own doctor, although probably everybody is a little bit. Um, but my, my goal is for you to really have a very deep understanding of all this kind of testing. So I, I actually think it's really important for patients to have kind of control of their results and to really understand their results. I see a lot of patients who come uh, after having their conditions for many years, after seeing multiple physicians, and w we spend a lot of time sort of trying to figure out which piece of information is where and what do we have to find out here and, and getting these pieces. And I think that um, in order to be your own best health advocate, it's really great for you to have control of all your information, to keep that organized. And my hopes in this talk is really to give you the vocabulary so that you're comfortable with it and that you can understand what all that stuff is, okay? So I'm gonna start with the first case, and this is a case with a, di a new diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. So a 50-year-old woman is referred to a rheumatologist for evaluation of joint pain and a positive ANA. And uh, so she went to her primary care doctor with those complaints. They saw the ANA after they checked that because of the joint pain. They send it on to the rheumatologist. And she has noted for the last six months that her fingers changed color in the cold. And she's also had some reflux and cough and has noted some changes in the skin of her hands. And um, on physical examination, her vital signs are checked and everything looks normal. When we listen to her lungs, they sound clear and her heart sounds normal. She's not swollen, her belly's okay. And in that cold physician's exam room, Raynaud's phenomenon is evident. Her nail fold capillaries are abnormal. Her hands are puffy and there's skin thickening and tendon friction rub. So let's see what all that looks like. So a picture of Raynaud's phenomenon. This is a picture of early puffy hands or edematous changes of the hands and systemic sclerosis. Another picture of that, and then this is a picture from a patient of mine, and I think you can really see that that swelling, or we'll use the term edema, and that struggle as he tries to close his hands um, in a fist. Um, so actually, just by touching the hands, the physician, the rheumatologist should be able, at, with this kind of presentation, to already have a very clear idea that this is systemic sclerosis or something in the spectrum of systemic sclerosis. So another very important part of this early examination is nail fold capillaroscopy. And I'll go to the, back to that picture in a second, but there are different techniques to do nail fold capillaroscopy, meaning looking at the tiny blood vessels uh, in the fingers. One is by using a microscope, one is by using a handheld tool called a dermatoscope. These are tools that dermatologists use to help evaluate whether pigmented lesions or pig moles are melanoma-like, but we can use them for this purpose too. And then there's a fancier one called video capillaroscopy. Um, so if we look at 
um, the different um, patterns, this is what just exactly what you can see when you use those tools for magnification. So this is normal. You should be able to visualize the blood vessels, and I'm talking about where we look is right, right there on the fingertips, right where the nail meets the uh, skin. So this box here is normal. In this, uh, in this panel, you can see dilation of the nail folds. They're much, much wider in caliber, the capillaries. And then here, you see again this dilation and also hemorrhage, which can happen. And here, this would be in a patient who's had scleroderma for many years. You see avascular areas or areas where there has been kind of a dropout of some of those blood vessels. So those changes are very specific to scleroderma and really are very powerful in helping us make uh, the diagnosis. So this is some more pictures of that. And this is some pictures that some of my colleagues have taken um, using some of these different techniques. So just with that, without any testing, just a careful physical exam and listening to this patient's complaint, um, this rheumatologist would be able to, at that moment, tell that, that patient that, that she has um, scleroderma. And I'm sure that they would want to do some additional testing and confirmation. But it, with these kinds of tools, it is easier. It, it is, you are able to make, um, make this diagnosis early. Um, and these are the 2013 ACR ULAR classification criteria for systemic sclerosis. So this patient already meets these criteria. Um, they, ha the, they have skin thickening, um, and if they're beyond the MCPs, those are these joints here, then you can make this diagnosis. Uh, other finger changes, abnormal nail fold capillaries, and Raynaud's phenomenon would all help you make this diagnosis. So looking at ca nail fold capillaries is a very important part in um, trying to determine whether Raynaud's is primary or secondary. Um, but it is also uh, a kind of exam that you really, the physician has to really be trained in. It's not always easy, like I just showed. I made it a little easy looking. But it can, because um, other things can cause that hemorrhage, for example. So you could imagine you stick your hand in your purse, something stabs you when you're not looking, and you get hemorrhage then. Or um, if you had an aggressive manicure, that will make the, uh, the nail folds look a little abnormal. And so the physician really has to kind of distinguish those things. And then there can be some changes that would be a little bit nonspecific. So it's not, I don't think anyone would see one abnormal blood vessel and say, you have scleroderma because you have Raynaud's. It would be, it's more of something that you look for this clue and that clue, and you have to look for, you have to reach out and find these uh, physical exam cues, and then it, it helps you to bring together a picture. But it is useful in making the diagnosis early, and a lot of, a lot of folks do struggle with having that initial diagnosis made, and these are some of the tools we have for it. So when this patient um, is sitting there in the office, and her, her doctor is going to go and order some blood tests, and um, probably much, much, much more blood than this patient ever thought was imaginable to take from her would be taken. And these are some of the, the reports um, that we're going to look at. And this is actually one of those pieces of information. I'm going to go over some things that are a little bit boring, but I do think that this is the type of thing that is important for you to have a handle on so you can have a sort of an understanding of, of how things are going. So one basic, basic lab is a CBC or a complete blood count. And I hope you can see it, otherwise it might be in the handouts. And these are, this is a printout from one of my patient's labs. And, um, and this is what it looks like. So you get a WBC or a white blood cell count, a hemoglobin, 
a hematocrit, and a platelet count. And in this patient, she had a normal white blood cell count. Her hemoglobin is a tiny bit low. That means she has mild anemia and uh, her platelet count is normal. And this gives me a sense uh, you know, of how she's doing. Then there's a lot more information on here and you don't have to know all that stuff. But if you know those pieces, that's good. The white blood cell count, for example, if it's very low, um, the patient would be more at risk for infections because that's part of the immune system uh, functioning. If it's higher than normal, there are many explanations for that. Um, but it would just be something for uh, for the physician to pause and explain. So for example, white blood cell counts go up on prednisone. They go up if you have an infection and there are all different reasons for them to go up. Um, and we monitor them also in terms of medication. Some of the immunu immunosuppressive medicines that we use can, can suppress all the cells that are in the uh, in the complete blood count. So it can suppress white blood cell count, hemoglobin, or platelets. And, um, and so these are things we have to monitor pretty regularly when we're using um, medications. Another basic test here is the comprehensive metabolic panel. This tells the electrolytes, the sodium, the potassium, the chloride. It also tells kidney function with the BUN and the creatinine um, and uh, serum glucose, the blood sugar, calcium. And then this panel of tests from protein, albumin, bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, AST, and ALT. Those are all liver tests. And looking at them as a whole gives a sense of if there's any abnormality in the liver. And you can have abnormalities in the creatinine and the liver, either as medications toxicity, medication toxicities or as manifestations of the disease. So we have to uh, monitor those closely. Also on this set of labs, we did something called a CPK or a creatine phosphokinase. This is a muscle enzyme. So for patients who have muscle disease or inflammatory muscle disease, that level can go up. This patient has a low level and that reflects just in general that she has uh, somewhat low muscle mass. Um, and I'll skip the other ones on here, but they are all, all of these kinds of tests um, are, are helpful in terms of monitoring both disease activity and, um, uh, and medication toxicity. Um, these are, this is what tests of uh, urinalysis and a urine culture look like. Um, and the main things on the urinalysis are to look at protein and cells. So these are all just sort of general things to have an idea about. Now, one thing we'll do in working up an early patient with systemic sclerosis is look at autoantibodies. So um, there are many different autoantibodies that we check. Um, an ANA is something that you may have heard of, SCL70, centromere, and RNA polymerase 3 are all antibodies that are specific to scleroderma. It, it is, would be very unusual to see those positive in other conditions. Um, a U1 RNP or an RNP antibody is also seen in scleroderma, but can also be seen in the mixed connective tissue disease and overlapping connective tissue disease. Some folks with lupus will have an RNP positive, so it's less specific. Um, many folks who have Scleroderma can also have Rho and La antibodies positive. Those are considered Sjogren's antibodies and may be associated with other manifestations like dry eye and dry mouth, um, but can also be seen overlapping with scleroderma. So we'll check all this. Um, we check usually a rheumatoid factor, which a lot of folks with scleroderma will have a rheumatoid factor positive, and a CCP, which is much more specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So when we see folks with scleroderma who also have a CCP antibody, and, and this is something that happens in a 
I think about 2% of patients, maybe 3%, depending on how you look at it, um, we do um, get concerned that if they develop arthritis, it may be more rheumatoid-like, which can be er erosive arthritis. Um, so, so these are just things we keep in mind. Lupus autoantibodies um, are double-stranded DNA in Smith and antiphospholipid antibodies um, cardiolipin beta-2 glucoprotein and lupus anticoagulant, these are all different blood tests that we um, can check in. And they, to some degree, help with diagnosis, but also to some degree help us determine whether there can be any overlap. You don't have to get all these blood tests done every time. <laughs> um, and actually, with the um, scleroderma-specific antibodies, they don't usually change over time, um, and so it's, it's not necessary to get them repeatedly. All right, these are patterns of ANA, and this is what it looks like when you, um, you, you, you use standard cells and you use the patient's serum or the part of the blood that has all the proteins in it but not the cells. You use that and uh, then you, you add on in some other antibodies that fluoresce, and you're able to see these different patterns. And um, this, this one down here is called nucleolar, and this one is called speckled. And those are the two that we tend to see in systemic sclerosis, although you could see the other patterns too. And this is um, an ANA with a centromere pattern. Um, so that's what it, it looks like, and a technician will read these. Um, so ANA is positive in most patients with scleroderma, and again, usually it doesn't switch, and usually in terms of the scleroderma antibodies, they're generally mutually exclusive. They don't, only one of them will tend to be positive. Um, and so um, the antibodies uh, tend to um, uh, cluster with the types of scleroderma. So in diffuse scleroderma, we tend to see the SCL70 or the RNA polymerase 3 antibody. U3 RNP is uh, not commer easily commercially available, so we don't always get that. And then uh, with limited scleroderma, you tend to see the anticentromere, the PMSCL, or the, uh, the U1 RNP is really an overlap. Um, and you can, uh, and again, the bolded ones are commercially available. The not bolded ones are really um, in research labs. And these are the ones seen with overlapping uh, conditions. So auto an autoantibodies, you, you may have had a full talk on this, but they, um, they do um, tend to correlate with organ system involvement. So uh, folks who have any SCL70 positive may have worse fibrosis or more likely to have pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and those who have anticardiolipin antibody have a little bit higher risk of pulmonary hypertension. And so these are useful um, for us uh, physicians to help kind of keep our, um, our, our spidey senses uh, going in the right direction. And this is just an updated uh, slide that um, I don't think will project very well. And then after we do the blood work, we're going to do a lot of additional testing, echocardiogram, pulmonary function tests, uh, other imaging of the chest, maybe imaging of the GI tract. And I'll go over that imaging in some other cases. And we'll do that, though, in the beginning, in the initial diagnosis of a scleroderma patient, because we want to sort of stage what's going on and get a sense of what organs are involved um, early on so we know how to direct our care. Um, so here we are at case two. This one is a 50-year-old male with diffuse scleroderma. And um, for he's had scleroderma for two years. And he notes increasing dyspnea on exertion. So that is a medical term that means uh, shortness of breath while exerting himself. So the way he describes it is he's slowing down. When he's outside walking, he has to stop on hills and stairs, going much more slowly, and this has been progressive. 
So I want to introduce this term, differential diagnosis. So that gentleman who, um, who has this dyspnea on exertion can have any number of different things. Um, and this differential diagnosis is the thought process that your doctor goes through when they are doing all their testing. It's the reason why for the different directions that they go in. So maybe he has interstitial lung disease. That, that can cause shorter breath, but so can all these other things. Pulmonary hypertension, uh, any trouble with the muscle of the heart, or he could have something like coronary artery disease, uh, or a blood clot in the lung, uh, anemia, just having a low blood count might give this shortness of breath. Maybe there's an infection like a pneumonia, or uh, maybe the muscle is getting weak from inflammatory um, muscle conditions. So these would all be different things that, that, um, that the physician has to work out. Um, so so we, uh, we do a physical examination, and we notice that he has crackles on exam. So when we listen to the lung with the stethoscope at the bottom here at the lung, we can hear a, an abnormal sound um, that sounds like crackles, so that's what we call it. And this patient all has, also has some edema on his lower extremities bilaterally. So crackles can be seen with um, uh, if there's water or fluid in the lungs, like with heart failure, or can also be heard uh, with interstitial lung disease. It sounds a little bit different uh, from the, the two conditions. So we'll use the term dry crackles or wet crackles, but um, I don't know how good we all really are at determining those. Maybe some of the older physicians are better <laughs> than, than us younger ones. Um, the edema on the lower extremities, that can, is sometimes a sign of, of heart failure, uh, but it can be seen in other things too. Um, if the protein is very low, if the kidneys are not working, or sometimes we just get edema on the lower extremities um, at the end of the day from the, uh, the blood vessels having a hard time getting everything back up. Uh, so, but muscle strength is normal. That means that it's be, it would be unlikely for him to have inflammatory muscle disease. And blood work, the basics are normal. So the blood count, the metabolic panel, the CPK, all good. So that means it's not likely to be anemia or a liver problem or a kidney problem. So we, we get all that stuff out of the way. Um, and so then um, we're going to... Um, take a look at what's going on in the lungs, and we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, so here we're gonna use these tests to help us diagnose what's going on with this patient. Um, but in other settings, we might, um, we actually would do pulmonary function tests and probably some imaging just as standard to screen a scleroderma patient for the development of lung disease, even if they didn't complain of these kinds of symptoms. So one e test that we do regularly is a chest x-ray, and you get a picture like this, um, and this is helpful. Um, however, and in this picture, you know, this is the heart here. We can see that the heart is a normal size. I can see the corners of the lungs here. I know that there's not a lot of fluid here in the chest cavity, so the patient's not in heart failure. Um, there's a little bit of haziness here, and I don't know that I know if that's something for me to worry about or not, because we're looking just at a chest x-ray here. And a chest x-ray just kind of gives you a snapshot. It's an easy test, but it's not that helpful in terms of looking for um, interstitial lung disease, especially. It will, it will miss it a lot. Um, so when we are... Uh, trying to get a sense, so you can see how this picture here really looks like that chest x-ray you just saw, and uh, these are the, the, the lungs here, and if we could get down to a microscope, we would see um, the different, uh, these are called alveoli, and that's where oxygen takes, uh, oxygenation of the blood takes place. So tiny little blood vessels run all the way at the ends here of the alveoli, and that's how um, air, it air crosses the tissue there of the alveolus and gets into the red blood cells, and that's how we oxygenate uh, our, our bodies. Um, so this is a picture of a normal CT of the chest. 
um, and you can see how nice and dark everything looks. Here are the airways. Uh, these are um, the bronchi. Those are larger airways, and they branch off to little, little uh, tinier airways. So you can see this is more on a kind of macro level, and here is more of a micro level, but you get a sense that, that we're looking at that. And then this is a patient who has interstitial lung disease. So we had previously been nice and black here in the lung tissue. And here as we get lower, we have a lot of this haziness that cause, that's caused by thickening of the interstitium and inflammation in that area. And you get some widening of the bronchi here called bronchiectasis. As an aside, I'll just point out, because we're here, this patient also has a very dilated esophagus, that's what that structure is, with fluid in it. So that is pretty typical in scleroderma. So if we go back to the microscope level, what happens in interstitial lung disease, we have thickening of that interstitium, that tissue of the alveolus that um, the little oxygen molecules have to get across to get in your blood get into the blood, it gets thick, and, and that causes decreased oxygenation. So this is one way we have to look at that. This is a person getting a pulmonary function test, um, and this is another picture of that. And, um, and then this is what the printout looks like when we get the PFT. So this is our other, another very powerful way that we have that helps us gauge not only um, what, the PFTs don't make a diagnosis, they help become part of that, but um, it also helps us gauge to some degree severity of what's going on. So there are a lot, a lot, a lot of features here on that. And we're not going to look at all the different things in the pulmonary function tests. But there are certain measurements that are very important for us. So we'll start with the one on top called the FVC, or the force vital capacity. And when they take this, there's a reference value. And that would be the value that would be considered normal for a person of the same age and the same height and the same gender. So those things go into this calculation of what is normal. And then we get a measured value, so how when the, the person was taking the PFT, how well they did. And then you just make a percentage of that. So that's what we look at in terms of percentage of reference. And um, so in, ter in, uh, in this, uh, it, and there would be a normal range, right? So 80 to about 120% would be a normal range that we'd accept. But this, this uh, is lower than that. And when the FVC, the total lung capacity, are, uh, are lower, that shows some degree of restriction. The diffusion capacity down here, it, it measures how well oxygenation occurs across uh, the tissue of the lung. And this is also a percentage of the reference. Um, and these are some more. Then we look at some imaging of the heart. Uh, I, so some ways we look at the heart, we'll do an EKG. These are important for scleroderma patients to get uh, because folks who have cardiac involvement can have some arrhythmia or abnormalities there. So it can be helpful to have an EKG at some point as a baseline. And then an echocardiogram is an ultrasound picture of the heart. And it shows uh, these different kinds of values. And we can use this to help determine, again, a lot of measurements on here. But um, you can uh, look at um, a PA systolic pressure. That's an estimate of whether there's any pulmonary hypertension. And we can also look at an ejection fraction, which is how well the heart is pumping. Um, so it gives us, again, a lot of information. These would be very useful in terms of evaluating um, that patient with short of breath and, and working out that differential diagnosis. I'm going to skip through a few slides just so we can get through some more cases. All right, so case three is a 35-year-old woman recently diagnosed, and she has rapidly progressive diffuse scleroderma, and she presents with new onset high blood pressure. 
with a blood pressure uh, 180 over 100, and she's normally 100 over 60. So that would be a very, very big increase. And so in, in a case like this, we're concerned about uh, renal involvement in, in scleroderma. And um, so this patient was at particular risk for this complication because of her very rapidly and recently diagnosed, rapidly progressive and recently diagnosed systemic sclerosis. So one thing that I recommend to all my patients who are in that setting is to monitor their blood pressures at home. So I give a prescription for a blood pressure cuff and they look sort of like this. Um, some of them are very uh, intricate and do all kinds of fancy things, and others are more basic. Um, the ones that, for example, Medicare tends to pay for are uh, manual pumps. Usually they really need, do need a digital pump. It's good to check your, your blood pressure cuff against the blood pressure cuffs in your doctor's office because we, ha we have to maintain those blood pressure cuffs. They're tested, so you make sure yours is accurate. And then I have my patients journal what their blood pressures are. They, they have to write it down because we all have this tendency of like, oh, everything was, it was fine. I checked it, it was fine. It's just our natural way. <laughs> um, so you have to write it down so you know what what your normal is, and then you can tell when there's a change in the normal. And I always really push this because um, we've there are great medicines for this. We, we do well when we catch this early, and we can prevent all kinds of, um, of outcomes uh, it, sometimes. Um, and, and so I really want to catch this early. We have seen that it doesn't, ha the, the medicine that we use to treat this are a class of medicines called ACE inhibitors. We found that it doesn't help to give ACE inhibitors beforehand to prevent, but it is good to get them on board right away. And then we also monitor with periodic creatinines and urinalysis. The physiology behind this is that the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is completely out of whack and over-regulated. And the renin level will be very high in this setting. So that's something that I'll check in patients. I can just do a blood test and check a renin. And if that's very high, that helps me know what's going on. And if it's very low, then maybe they just have high blood pressure for regular reasons, like how a lot of other people have high blood pressure too. And um, we don't usually need to get a kidney biopsy when this is going on, but sometimes we do. And, and this is what a kidney biopsy would show. Um, the, this is a glomerulus. This is a structure of the kidney where um, it does some of its job. And, uh, and this gets kind of obliterated here. And, um, and there are different, different um, things that we see on pathology too. All right, so last case. Um, this is a 45-year-old woman with diffuse scleroderma for five years who has increasing difficulty swallowing. And there's cough and episodes of regurgitation or vomiting and food getting stuck when she swallows. So I'm going to show you some things about esophageal dysmotility. Some of these slides come from a colleague of mine um, in the gastroenterology department at Cornell. And so I want to give him some credit for all the great pictures. Um, so in terms of what this patient is going through, she has some degree of esophageal dysmotility. Um, motility or movement is the primary function of the esophagus. And the whole job of the esophagus is really just to transfer food from up here to down to your stomach and to prevent any misdirection of the food. And it's a muscular tube with sphincters or valves that close and help keep that forward uh, direction going. So if we made a cartoon of it, it would look it would look something like this. Um, a big muscular tube right by here. This is the, um, the trachea branching into the bronchi, the windpipe here. So it's right next to that. So up here, there's area for um, 
if uh, food or gastric contents are going in the wrong direction, it can wind up um, getting into the airway too. And that may be part of what makes interstitial lung disease either happen or progress. Um, the GI tract is affected in about 90% of patients with scleroderma, and any part of the GI tract can be involved. Uh, we're focusing on the esophagus here in this case. Esophageal involvement can happen because of the fibrosis in the esophagus, which can damage the muscle tissue or nerve tissue, and that all um, contributes to dysmotility. Um, so how do we, and, and uh, as a result of dysmotility, there can be reflux or dysphagia. Dysphagia is the, the, uh, the term for that patient's difficulty swallowing. We can make the diagnosis clinically. Um, that that um, clinical vignette that I gave where she's having trouble swallowing, I know that she has dysphagia. I, I know that we're dealing with esophageal dysmotility. But testing can be very helpful in confirming and in terms of ruling out other disorders. Um, and um, so how, how do we do that? Um, this is one test called a barium swallow, where um, this chalky substance is swallowed and uh, it makes a picture of the esophagus that looks like this. This is a picture of a patient with scleroderma and you can see how wide the esophagus is here. And that's a dilated esophagus in, in somebody who has abnormal motility. So the barium swallow is helpful to some degree, um, but endoscopy is actually very helpful here too. Uh, and these are some pictures of endoscopy. And manometry is another study that's done, which is when a tube is passed from the nose down into the stomach. This is a little bit uncomfortable, um, and uh, but it measures pressure uh, in the esophagus and gives a readout. So this is as somebody initiates a swallow, the pressure reading down the probe. Okay. So we and then um, sometimes pH testing is done and reflux too. Um, I think this is especially helpful in folks who are on proton pump inhibitors already. And the question, and they are still having reflux symptoms. And the question is whether you're adequately neutralizing the gastric acid with the proton pump inhibitor. So what kind of abnormalities might we find when we look at this? So I had told you that the endoscopy is very helpful. You can actually see everything right there with your own eyes, or the gastroenterologist can. And sometimes they can help fix things right when they're there. So these are pictures of reflux. So do you remember how nice and pink it looked before? Here you have this darker pink or red, uh, and that's just irritation to um, the esophagus that occurs with too much acid coming up from the stomach. So um, sometimes if this happens chronically, um, something called Barrett's esophagus can occur. Uh, and in Barrett's, the, um, the tissue of the esophagus is handling all this acid from the stomach and it changes to be um, more like intestinal tissue which can handle stomach acid. And uh, when that occurs, it, it's called metaplasia, but it's a, um, it's a, a factor that predisposes for esophageal cancer. And then folks who develop Barrett's really need monitoring. So these are the kinds of diagnoses that can be made with endoscopy and biopsy. Esophageal infection is something that, um, that we also sometimes see. So when I see esophageal infections in my scleroderma patients, it's usually somebody who um, is on a higher dose immunosuppression. They don't have to be, but that's usually how I see it. And they can get either yeast, this is a picture of candida or a yeast infection in the esophagus, 
or they can get viral um, uh, viral esophagitis too, and uh, and we can make these diagnoses on endoscopy. These are very painful, um, but uh, can be treated and are treated differently. It's you're not just giving a proton pump inhibitor here. You're giving different specific sorts of antifungals or antivirals in order to treat what's going on. And these are usually quite painful. And esophageal cancer, uh, this is some pictures of esophageal cancer. This is what it might look like on a barium and here. And, and when they, um, so it is important, especially in chronic reflux, to have this looked at. And sometimes in practice what I'll see are, um, are patients who start on proton pump inhibitors for reflux and they do very well. Their protonics is helping or their Nexium's helping. They're, they're happy. And um, they don't want to go to another doctor because they feel okay with, with respect to that issue. Um, but then it turns out that they're on these medicines for years and years and eventually it is good to have uh, a look-see uh, to make sure there's no other problems going on. Um, another thing that can happen in the esophagus is an esophageal stricture. And this is when a band of tissue comes and closes off. I think you can see that really nicely in the barium swallow. And this is what it looks like on endoscopy here and here. And, um, and these happen, again, as a result of chronic reflux, can make swallowing much harder, as you can see, obviously, why, and, um, and are actually... Um, highly amenable to treatment. So the gastroenterologist, when they're there, can uh, use a balloon and blow up a balloon right around here. It, it tears the tissue apart, but it heals well, and, um, and that really works to relieve that problem. Another esophageal problem here is eosinophilic esophagitis. This is something that has been in uh, recognized with some degree of increased frequency um, and relates to allergy and uh, and some other issues but um, we're we're picking this up a lot more now in non scleroderma patients and we do see this in scleroderma patients too then they can push the uh, camera from the esophagus into the stomach just beyond the esophagus and this is a picture of what um, watermelon stomach looks like or gave um, and and so all these kinds of diagnoses can be made using this tool these are um, some pictures of that esophageal um, uh, 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 manometry, sorry. So this is the normal one, and this is achalasia, or when the stomach is uh, very, uh, uh, the esophagus is very dilated, you can have this, um, uh, you, you know, the pressure is supposed to go all the way down like this, and here we just have very ineffective pressure going on. This is um, in comparison to a spastic esophagus here.